Cajun Crossroads is funded under a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Southern Educational Communications Association. you've heard may be true, some not so true. Tradition and change are both part of our story. We've entered the mainstream of American life, but we still enjoy a culture that somehow has set us apart. My name is Leroy Benoit. I've been born and raised in Vatican, and I have a good friend and his birthday is uh, today, and he's 74 years old. And we, we bring people from all over here when we have things like that going on. I mean, the uh, people of Vatican are very friendly, really, all around this part area. I, I wouldn't say only Vatican, but all around this part. The like, Asians around here are very, very uh, friendly people. A few years back, it was just about only French. But now the younger people are getting to where they don't want to talk their French to move, but that's the way it is. But we happy go luck is here. song made here in Vatican, I mean for the Vatican people. Cotton Rose, they call it, which they played it this afternoon. Les filles de Vatican a cassé le typicon dans les ronds de coton, which uh, you don't understand that, but uh, uh, all the people around here knows what it is, you know. Well, the, the girls uh, from Vatican, the girls from Vatican, and it, it went good for a while, I guarantee you that. It's been said that Cajuns play hard because they work hard, and for decades that meant farming and raising cattle, going back to the days of the first French Acadian settlers here, over 200 years ago. Today, 22 South Louisiana parishes make up what's called Acadiana. Not that everyone here is Acadian, or Cajun for that matter. And it was here on the prairies of Southwest Louisiana that our nation's cattle industry actually began. There are some who still trace their ancestry back to those early arrivals, exiles from old Acadie, today called Nova Scotia in Canada. I'm a Cajun. I'm the seventh generation from uh, General uh, Joseph Beausoleil Broussard, who migrated here from Canada because of the uh, expulsion of the, the English who were taking over Canada and getting rid of the Frenchmen that were there. When the Broussards migrated to southwest Louisiana back in the mid-1700s, they got a herd. They were able to pay with calves, in other words, by payment in kind. They got so many cows and so many bulls, then after so many years, they had to re return these this same amount of cattle back to the original owner. And I'm a seventh generation from the original Broussard, and we've all continuously been in the cattle business. These cattle are the Charley cattle. The Charley cattle were developed in France. Uh, they have records of these cattle being in France for several thousand years, a couple of thousand years back, that the uh, 
they've developed this particular breed. Our operation is primarily with registered cattle. We have only registered cattle, which uh, we uh, have customers on a worldwide basis. We've exported cattle uh, throughout South America, Africa, as far as Thailand. And that's the type of business I'm in. I'm not raising calves to be slaughtered for consumption. Our cattle go into breeding activities to uh, produce calves to go onto the market. This is the Fleur de Lis brand, which is one of the oldest recorded brands in the nation. And the reason we call this ranch the, Fleur, the Flying J Ranch is because of this particular brand, the Fleur de Lis. The Fleur de Lis, if you notice, is a J with wings. And that's the uh, flower of France. And it's an emblem showing the picture of a flying J. So that's why we call it the Flying J Ranch. A lot of the people believe the cattle industry started in Texas. Well, that's uh, Miss Norma. The first cattle industry was considered to have started here in southwest Louisiana. And uh, we, I say we, I'm talking about the Cajuns, have continued to uh, be in the cattle business since way back in the, before the United States was a country. And I am the seventh generation in the cattle business. And my children hopefully will continue to be in the cattle business. So it's, a, it's a, sort of a, a heritage in the family and the custom that we've had, a way of life, you might say. Heritage and custom, words you'll hear even with modern Cajuns, from the prairies of southwest Louisiana to the bayous of the southeast. Farming was the early way of life here, too, along the levees of the upper bayous, but Cajuns began fishing and trapping in later years, with shrimping and oystering common today. During the Great Depression of the 30s, an experience shared by all Americans, Cajun shrimpers borrowed a custom from their Gulf Coast neighbors, adapting it to their own changing lifestyle over the last 50 years. Okay, good luck, good luck. I'm Monsignor Frederick Brunette, and what we're having today is a boat blessing. It's a traditional thing on, in the Bayou country when we uh, gather all together as a community, and as the new shrimping season starts, we ask God's blessing upon the fishermen, their, their boats, the catch, you know, so that they'll have a nice, prosperous season and a safe one. And every year, they, they decorate their boats, and they, we uh, get on the lead boat, and we bless them as we go down the bayou, and they all fall in line. We have a nice parade down the bayou, and it's colorful and pretty. And as the boats come out into the lake, they make a little flotilla. And at every, almost every boat has crawfish uh, for this occasion. And they have other things, too, but they also have crawfish and crabs, and they're so pretty, and they taste better than they look. <laughs> and so that's what we're doing as a community today. It's, uh, it's basically French Cajun. I think that, you know, the culture here is basically, basically Cajun. But you have, today you have all kind of people. With the oil industry, a lot of influx of many people came into the area. And I, I don't think the Brunette family was a Cajun family. But we, but they've married into so many other families, like the Cool Stones, the, the Preston Backs, you know, uh, the Dubrayers, and so all of those, it's, so it's intermarried now. So I'm Cajun, even though I think, you know, the Brunette line probably could be traced back to France directly but the intermarriage. And that's probably true of everybody around here. You know? It's a down-to-earth community. The, the people are close to the land, close to the water. Uh, they, they have a good sense of humor. I don't know how to, you know. Like, well, when, when sometimes um, national groups or camera people come and they want to take pictures of the cages, they seem to want something that maybe existed 100 years ago, you know? And that's all changed now. They wanted a little cabin in the swamp with the alligators around it, and uh, you know, but that doesn't exist anymore. A lot of changes have taken place. Changes have taken place throughout South Louisiana, including the Great Atchafalaya Basin and Swamp, another environment Cajuns learned to inhabit 
and still a productive fishing ground. But as the swamp changes, so does its traditional relationship to the Cajuns who lived there. Uh, I got a crawfish, yeah. which proves that egrets eat crawfish. <laughs> I have a picture in my book of an egret eating a crawfish, and many people say, no, egrets don't eat crawfish. Seasons of Light is a book that I've been wanting to do for a long time. I, I wrote it, designed it, took the photographs, published it with a bank loan in 1983. Now it's in its second printing and it's doing very well. It's a lot of photographs of the Atchafalaya Basin, but also a lot of writing. Uh, and a couple of stories by William Faulkner, on whom I did my master's thesis in 1960. I'm working on a second book now that will deal primarily with the people who live here and make the Cajun people who make a living in the basin, especially when there's a husband and wife who fish together, or a man and his sons, and that kind of thing. The Atchafalaya Basin itself is filling up with sand and silt so fast that within 20 or 25 years, most experts believe the swamps will be full of, filled with sand, and, and that lifestyle that those Cajun people depend on will also be gone. And I want to record it properly while it's still flourishing. My family considers themselves Cajun, um, definitely. Um, their ancestors were Cajun, and for that reason alone, we're, we're Cajun. Uh, the fact is, we, we still speak Cajun French. Um, there's a lot of difference between standard French and and Cajun French, and the expression I use to, to display that difference often is, for example, in standard French, if I was saying, I'm going, I am going, je vais, it's so different from what I would hear in Catahoula, where we say, malikouri, and ma, malikouri doesn't sound anything like je vais, moi, aller to go, courir, to run, it still means I'm going in Catahoula. It's, it's more like 17th century French than than anything else, but it has influence from Spanish and Caribbean peoples and so forth. It's, it's easier for people from Canada to understand our language than it is for people from Paris, for example. When, when our oldest son went to school in the same place where I went, Catahoula, town in St. Martin Parish, uh, he was the only child in the first grade who spoke French. When I went to school there, I was the only child who spoke English. Everybody else spoke French at home, and in one generation, 23 years, I guess it was in our case, the whole situation changed. And he was a curiosity because he spoke French. <laughs> I was asked one time, are you proud to be Cajun? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very touchy question. I'm glad that I was born here and that I live in this beautiful area and that I can eat crawfish, for example. I've, I have my own small crawfish pond and I've eaten crawfish now for, for over three months every day. And there are not many people who can do that in this world. <laughs> or even who want to, I guess. Cajun pride and Cajun identity, whether it's a matter of eating crawfish every day, decorating a shrimp boat, tracing your ancestry back to Acadian times, or just plain speaking the language, it's something that crosses Cajun prairie, bayou, and basin. And it's certainly had its ups and downs over the years. It's sort of fa in fashion to, to, to be a Cajun today. It wasn't always so. Huh? When I uh, started school back, uh, I guess, 1936, we, uh, it wasn't, uh, in fact, it was uh, prohibited to talk French. And this is all we knew. We knew how to speak French. We knew our, our numbers in French. We knew our prayers in French. But the school teacher had the job of first teaching us the basic fundamentals of English. I knew not a word of English. Uh, so she had to prevent us, first thing they had to do was to prevent you from speaking French. And to do that, they had to punish you. So two generations of that completely lost, the, you know, completely eliminated the French language almost from our children. I have, I have two children, three children, and two of them hardly speak it. One who's an attorney has, has had to learn, he, you know, he can get by with it. But uh, it, now that, that being Cajun is fashionable again, and it, it's you know it's something to uh, to speak French. Matter of fact, in this courthouse, the I would say the three major offices are French-speaking um, Cajuns: uh, clerk of court, sheriff, assessor. Well, yeah, we were, we were Cajuns. We we uh, I remember as far back as I can remember, we were Cajuns. Uh, I remember my mother telling me the story of Evangeline, even though that was even though that was what Longfellow. I mean, you know, and. Uh, the earliest, uh, in fact, I remember when I was growing up, 
Mother used to talk about a silent movie that was Evangeline that was based on that poem. And it, that was a little pride then to being a Cajun, but it was just something you were. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't better, it wasn't worse, you were just a Cajun. Uh, then in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, the, uh, being Cajun was sort of depicted in the media, television, and, and, and the movies, and even in uh, magazines as being sort of a subhuman that lived in the swamps. That, uh, in fact, even in the 50s, they were depicting Cajuns who might have existed back in the 1800s. Well, they were depicting that type and that culture as being our modern culture. For example, not everybody lives in the Appalachian where Little Abner and, 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 and uh, Moonshiners. Same thing with us. We did have swamps. We did have bayous. We did use pirogues. We, uh, we did hunt and trap and fish. I remember not really wanting to admit outside of Louisiana that I was a Cajun. Uh, it, it wasn't something that you wanted to go outside and brag about. Now it is. The story of Evangeline may have been a more prideful image for some Cajuns, but it too was a stereotype centered on a love story between Evangeline and Gabriel, the good and virtuous Acadians of Longfellow's epic tale. Both the 19th century poem and the movies based on it tell of the exile of the French Acadians from their beloved homeland of 100 years, then under British rule and called Nova Scotia. Refusing to take up arms for Britain and to pledge allegiance to the British crown, the Acadians are loaded onto ships bound for Britain's seaboard colonies. Scattered among English settlers and mostly Protestants, they spend a traumatic decade of rejection, deprivation, and harassment, finally making their way to South Louisiana, their new Eden. Although Longfellow's lovers never met in Louisiana, their legendary real-life counterparts are said to have reunited here, along the banks of the Bayou Teche, under the spreading branches of the now famous Evangeline Oak, which really marks the little town of St. Martinville as a prime shooting location for Edwin Carew's 1929 film. But Evangeline's popular appeal is undeniable, and it's all too often substituted for any real knowledge of our history in Louisiana. The Acadian story is one of suffering and dispersal, but also of determination to perpetuate a way of life, one based on land, God, and family. And that meant land ownership, the Catholic faith, large families, and tightly knit kinship groups. Far from accepting their lot in Nova Scotia, the Acadians resisted their persecution in all attempts to resettle them, not just in the British seaboard colonies, but back in feudal France as prisoners in England and in the French Caribbean island of Saint-Domingue, today's Haiti. A decade after Le Grand Dérangement, the exile which began in 1755, the first boatloads of Acadians began arriving in New Orleans, and for 20 years, thousands more would come driven by the desire to reunite their families on lands available in French Catholic Louisiana, even after the territory was transferred to Spain. Distinct settlement areas began to emerge, west of the Atchafalaya Basin near Bayou Teche and later Bayou Vermilion, on the Acadian coast along the Mississippi River, above both New Orleans and an existing German settlement, and in the upper regions of the Bayou Lafourche waterway. The Acadians prospered in Louisiana and soon recovered the standard of living known in Nova Scotia. If they hadn't exactly recreated a nouvelle Acadie in their new subtropical environment, they had certainly begun to carve their own determined niche in Louisiana history. But that's the true story of the Acadians. The true story of the Cajuns involves another 200 years. Cajun culture is not Acadian culture. The culture it was not brought intact from Acadia, uh, established here in Louisiana, and we're enjoying that culture as it was brought here. There have been so many influences on the culture of, of South Louisiana uh, since that time uh, that um, we could never hope to say that what we have and are calling Cajun culture is a direct line, uh, cultural line from Acadia here. We might very well speak of them as Acadians in the 18th century when they arrive. Today, I think we have to speak of them in terms of Cajuns. 
because the culture has become something more than it was in uh, Acadia. Cajuns are not necessarily Acadians. Uh, Cajun culture incorporated uh, the, Acadia, the Acadian element, but it also incorporated the French Creoles and, and the Germans and the Spanish and, and the Anglo-Americans and, and just about everybody else who came here. Uh, up until the turn of this century, if you wanted to buy a loaf of bread, if you moved to South Louisiana and you wanted to buy a loaf of bread, you had to speak French. And so daily life was in French. And, and the most overwhelming, for some reason, the most overwhelming um, cultural identity was the, was the Cajuns. And somewhere along the way, though there are those who, who uh, distinguish themselves from the Cajuns, there are, there are French Creole families that don't call themselves Cajuns, but they are rather the exception than the rule. There are lots of French immigrant families from, uh, who came in, uh, who, whose ancestors came to Louisiana in the 19th century, uh, who have nothing to do with the Acadians at all, except maybe they might have intermarried with some somewhere along the way. But names like Fusier and Fontenot and Vidrine and, and uh, De La Husse and all those families, and uh, French Creole families that were here earlier and French Creole families that came in uh, during the 19th century, who now call themselves Cajuns. So the, the, the term Cajun is much larger than Acadian. There's some really important things to be said about this. One is that the very word Acadian is an English word. It is not the word they would have used to describe themselves. They would have called themselves in the late 18th century les Acadiens. Uh, that would have probably been more like or said like Cajun uh, in, in the language of, of this people. Hence, they were themselves that. Uh, they came to be called by English speakers primarily uh, other things, some of them not very flattering. And the, the uh, process of, of uh, well, the English, the Anglos, trying to pronounce Cajun was difficult, so it came out something like Cajun. And almost immediately, and I date this from uh, the mid-19th century, almost immediately the very word Cajun became a pejorative meaning someone who was illiterate, crude, rude, uh, a peasant buffoon, uh, totally ignorant. Uh, this and all the other things that, that were associated with being one of that benighted group. They themselves would have continued to refer them to themselves as Kajan. And Kaja we remained, absorbing cultural influences through intermixing and intermarrying, yet developing our own identity, one which distinguished us from the others who settled here, including Les Américains. The Anglo-American influx began in earnest after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 and statehood in 1812. It was the growing plantation economy that attracted the Americans, an economy also associated with the Creole French, descendants of colonials who were here before the Acadians, and Creoles from the Caribbean islands chased out by revolutions there. From the beginning, the aristocratic French Creoles and the Americans looked down on the Acadians as peasant farmers, though many of them were proud and prosperous ones. But there were Acadian families too who joined the ongoing process of plantation development, buying more land, acquiring slaves, and assimilating to the plantation lifestyle, becoming a sort of Acadian upper class and producing two 19th century Louisiana governors. The great majority of Acadian descendants did not assimilate to this plantation lifestyle, calling those who did gros chiens, big dogs, or cajas dorés, gilded Cajuns. Instead, they took advantage of new lands available for settlement and migrated further from their original sites to pursue independent frontier lives, farming and raising livestock, often with three or four slaves, Others later pushed into coastal marshes, river basins, and swamps to fish and trap. They lived in relative isolation, and there they remained for nearly two centuries, separated from the mainstream world by language, social structures, and traditions. The Cajun stereotype of later years sprang from this group of Acadian descendants. Though social stratification within the group grew increasingly complex over the years, outsiders who did not understand the developing culture saw them as a monolithic body, 
and one to be scorned and ridiculed. Sometimes the antagonism was mutual. Over the course of the 19th century and well into the 20th century, there was something of a palpable rejection, again, of many of the American materialist values uh, that the Cajun population, by and large, simply didn't want any of. They had a kind of sense that, that it was in this, this overwhelming American materialism that somehow the essence of what they didn't like about Americans in here. Uh, there was also the fact that whatever Americans were, they didn't want to be. And I, I think with regard to the Texans, who were uh, from the very beginning so instrumental in the oil industry uh, in South Louisiana, there was a constant uh, division between the Cajuns uh, and the, the, the Texans, uh, looking even back to the railroad uh, days, um, in which we can see the uh, Cajun population uh, coming up with derisive names uh, for Texans. Uh, there, there was a Cajun equivalent of redneck, for example. Uh, I won't s tell you what it was in French because it involves a bad word. Uh, the, uh, well, one, one of them isn't too bad. They, they came up with a, with a phrase of coup brule, which simply means burned neck, uh, to refer to, uh, to these, these kind of unpleasant outsiders, uh, even as the outsiders had, had choice names for the Cajuns, too. Uh, including Cajun uh, or Cooney or some derivative. And this ongoing disparagement prevailed literally from the beginning of the, of the Cajun presence uh, in this country. The isolation and the antagonism reinforced cultural boundaries. And at the turn of the century, Cajun identity was still intact. Though they had adapted to a radically different environment, and absorbed many influences over the years, apparent today in cooking styles, music, even surnames and language, Cajun culture also had escaped the most overwhelming influence of all, Americanization. But Cajuns also entered the 20th century, like most Southerners, relatively poorer than mainstream America. And poverty became part of the stereotype of what was once a prosperous and industrious people. The poverty came about after the Civil War. Well, poverty was a general uh, situation that existed across uh, Louisiana. We have to remember that the economy was completely destroyed uh, by the uh, Civil War. Uh, and because it was primarily, if not overwhelmingly, uh, an agricultural economy, uh, it did not revive uh, for uh, many years after the Civil War. As a matter of fact, there's a uh, question in some agricultural historians' minds that oh, did it recover at all until uh, the 1940s and 50s after, uh, or with the coming of World War II. The oil industry came along and completely changed that situation. It's been estimated that in the last 50 years, oil and gas producers in Louisiana have extracted over 12 billion barrels of oil and 113 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Oil and related industries became Louisiana's biggest employer, biggest landowner, and biggest taxpayer, at one time generating over 40% of the state's economy. South Louisiana has been the center of that activity. Cajun country is also oil and gas country. It began in 1901 when Scott Haywood of Texas oil fame paid Cajun farmer Jules Clément $10 and drilled for oil on his property in Acadia Parish near the small town of Evangeline. The investment paid off with the state's first gusher. By the 1930s, the industry had spread across Louisiana and down into the marshes, bayous, and shallow coastal waters. After World War II, as the technology for exploration and production advanced, oil moved offshore into deeper waters. The industry's big buildup in the 50s began to transform the Cajun farm town of Lafayette into a district oil center, a hub city that would one day boast of 300 millionaires amongst its population. For Cajuns, things would never be the same again. Oil meant cash for drilling rights on farmland. Oil meant royalty payments for producing wealth. And most of all, oil meant jobs. In the early days, les Texiens were brought in to work for oil. 
a new wave of outsiders invading the Cajun stronghold. But as the industry grew, the local workforce became its blue-collar backbone. Okay, my nickname is Rat. All my friends call me Rat. The younger ones call me Mr. Rat. And that derived from my dad. My dad's name was Raul. And they cut his nickname down to Ra. And Ra in French, as you know, is Rat. Ra, Ra, Rat. So even though my name was not Raul, I, uh, I used to do a lot of the things my dad did, uh, trap and fish and hunt. And everybody started calling me a little rat, so it's just hung on all this year, all these years. Right now we're in uh, Texaco Lake Pelto field. Uh, Texaco uh, started in Lake Pelto, I guess, in the late 30s or mid 30s. I would imagine when Texaco first started, we had mostly foreigners, but now it's probably 95% uh, of the uh, local employees are Cajun or Cajun origin. My father just retired with, with this company, uh, Texaco, for 35 years. He worked with Texaco for 35 years. He retired. Uh, my grandfather worked uh, mostly farming. You know, they, they, they were farmers in them days. But um, myself and my father both worked in the oil field uh, all, our, all our adult lives. I am a head roustabout, pushing the roustabout crew here for Texaco, and uh, we take care of uh, felt, actually three fields. Uh, anything that breaks, we are the ones that fix it. It wasn't just the company payroll that put money in Cajun pockets over the years. A huge service and supply sector grew up to meet oil's needs, and by the oil boom of the 70s, opportunities for making money were everywhere. The South Louisiana economy flourished, the first real prosperity known since the lumber boom at the turn of the century. And the wealth generated by oil brought South Louisiana and its Cajuns into the 20th century. Today's Cajuns are a product of this cultural evolution that has been taking place in South Louisiana. The residents of South Louisiana remained in a state of uh, isolation to a degree for a long time because of the lack of uh, public roads in the area, because of uh, lack of uh, communication, transportation, electricity, for example. The rural areas of Louisiana did not get electricity until the late 40s. With the coming of the oil industry, uh, the Acadian population, the Cajun people, uh, were given an opportunity now to leave the farm and get into a um, type of work, an occupation that uh, paid well and allowed them some of the comforts of, uh, of uh, the modern world. Uh, the result is that uh, they have been moving steadily into mainstream America. Uh, you can travel the roads of South Louisiana today and you're going to see very few of the so-called typical Cajun houses, the cypress, um, the wooden cypress house uh, on piers, uh, but you're going to see many, many, many uh, ranch-style houses, uh, California bungalows, and uh, other types of uh, housing. Uh, just recently, we have uh, gone out into the highways and byways of uh, Acadiana looking for what remains of the 19th century, and there's very, very little. The uh, automobile is here to stay. There may have been buggies, and, and that was very uh, pleasant and, and quaint uh, to see people going off to church on Sunday morning in their buggy. But somebody had to hitch up that horse. Somebody had to feed that horse, care for that animal. Uh, somebody got wet when it rained, and now they uh, get into their Ford Chevrolet or Toyota, whatever it is, and off they go uh, uh, to church or wherever, on, uh, wherever they wish to go. Uh, and this is a cultural leap forward. It was certainly an economic leap forward, but one with a cruel twist. The collapse in the 80s of the price of oil, oil production, and the better part of the state's economy left some South Louisiana parishes with 30% unemployment rates and long lines at bankruptcy court. The big question facing many Cajuns today is how to support the newer and richer lifestyles that came with oil. And as for the cultural effects of mainstreaming and the loss of the traditional culture, well, that's viewed with mixed emotions within the Cajun community. 
Well, there were, two, there were many things that, that got into the Cajun culture to, to, to modernize it and make it more American. A lot of people think, unfortunately, the, the two world wars, a lot of young men went off uh, to those and came back knowing more about the rest of the world. But television came in, and this is the first time, really, that a Cajun family would hear a lot of standard English spoken. You know, when I was growing up at Catahoula, uh, everyone spoke French, and uh, you just wouldn't hear a lot of English. And, and uh, so with the oil companies, the two world wars, and television coming in, um, these three things almost at the same time in the 40s and 50s and so forth, um, did a lot to reveal to, Cajun, to the Cajun people what the outside world is like today. And, uh, and I'm afraid uh, encouraged a lot of them to leave behind some of their old ways eventually. And, uh, the, the old ways they had of doing things and, and uh, along with their language. It seems to me in my day-to-day -day activities and talking, taking photographs of Cajuns, dealing um, like myself, Cajun, that I see less and less through the years of the old traditions, the customs, uh, for example, killing a pig at home and making the sausage and the hogshead cheese and all of the things that everybody used to do, including my own family and we don't do anymore. It's a kind of arbitrary thing. I, I kind of see the Atchafalaya Swamp and the Cajun culture as running out more or less together. So I see the swamp filling up more and more with sand, becoming less productive, becoming more polluted, uh, and I see the Cajun culture becoming more diluted at the same time. And I don't like to see either of those things happen. Cultural leap forward or loss of culture? Pretty opposing viewpoints of the Cajun experience in the last 50 years. The growth of oil, the world wars, mass communications like television, but before that, movies, radio, English language newspapers, all produced an ongoing exposure to the outside world and its more modern lifestyles. By the 40s, many Cajuns were looking much like Americans anywhere. Well, maybe not exactly. That decade also saw the enforcement of compulsory education in English, which also contributed heavily to the assimilation process. Cajuns weren't just looking more like Americans, they were sounding more like them too. Nowhere is the loss of traditional culture more evident than in the declining use of our Cajun French language, especially in the home and with the younger generation. Comment vous préparez les des navets? Comment vous êtes cuit ça? Des franches les bouilles et des franches fanées tout fait avec. It is not uncommon to find families where grandparents or great grandparents speak only French which the younger children are barely able to understand beyond simple greetings and commands. <laughs> and the older generation tries to make the best of the situation. She says, uh, she speaks to them in French, and sometimes when she sees that they really can't understand, she'll, she'll try saying a word or two that they will kind of grasp what she's saying. If she can grasp what they're saying, and they grasp what she's saying, with one word or two, sometimes they can communicate. Others share that feeling. A few even demand French only at home. Their reasons are simple. I think uh, the French language in Louisiana is a very, very important identity marker. There are others in our culture, but language is, in my opinion, uh, easily the most important one. That's, that's the thing that has really set us off from our neighbors in Texas and uh, Arkansas and Mississippi and North Louisiana 
Uh, it's what made it's what's made us immediately distinguishable. I mean, we don't look all that different. Uh, we, there are a lot of things that we do that are very similar. You know, up until very recently, Cajun, uh, Cajun uh, standard Cajun fare was cornbread and beans, just like the rest of the South. But the language immediately set us off. And it's my, my I'm afraid that if the language is lost, um, we're going to lose a very essential part of the culture. Uh, I think it would be tragic at this point in Louisiana's development to suddenly find ourselves unable to communicate with our past because we no longer spoke the language. And I think that for me, the language question looms large in, in the struggle uh, to uh, preserve some dignity and some, some sense of identity. In the late 60s, a plan was devised to put the teaching of French back into the classroom, reversing a long-standing policy that banned French on school grounds. Today, fourth and fifth graders in some Acadiana public schools receive 30 minutes of French language instruction daily, hardly enough to become bilingual, but as much as strained education budgets allow. The effort began with a state agency called CODAFIL, the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana. And the question of what French language and culture to teach was controversial from the start. Codafil began by importing teachers from Quebec, Belgium, and France to instruct Louisiana children in international French. Although two-thirds of the teachers are now Louisiana teachers, and the State Board of Education develops curriculum, Codafil's efforts to revitalize language still face many challenges. You know, that's not easy to uh, determine exactly what French and for who we're going to uh, promote and organize activities. And today I believe that we are reaching a pretty good compromise where we are using cultural uh, elements of the local culture. And uh, we have a pretty good compromise between the spoken Cajun French and a uh, written standard French, uh, which some people call Parisian French, but it is not Parisian French, because Parisian French would be mostly slang anyway. It's good international French that get, can be spoken and understood all over the world. So Code of Phil dates back to 68, and it was mandated by the state legislator, legislature to do whatever would be necessary to preserve the French language and culture in Louisiana which could not have been any broader and undefined. And today we still have a problem with that. It's beautiful, but of course it's extremely broad. And when you know then the French fact in Louisiana, what it is, and how the variety of the French uh, influence in Louisiana uh, still is today, uh, it is difficult because the Creoles of New Orleans, the Cajuns of South Louisiana, uh, the Cajuns from uh, uh, southeast Louisiana and the Cajuns from southwest Louisiana, the black Creole speaking people and the American people who just want to learn French as a second language are all very different and uh, their needs are not the same. So uh, we have a difficult problem with a very small agency, only eight full-time, nine full-time people and a lot of work to do. The broad array of French cultural programs supported by Codafil are credited for helping to achieve one very important goal in the last 20 years, dispelling the stereotypes that prevailed for so long and returning pride to the Cajun community. French language radio and television programs, French language publications including poetry and plays written in Cajun French, cultural festivals, and even exchange programs with other countries in the Francophone world have all made French good and Cajun an acceptable term after years of scorn and derision. But it wasn't Codafil alone that sparked today's cultural resurgence. I believe that beginning in the early to mid-1970s, there began to be a revived interest in ethnicity among the Cajun people, at least among some of them. 
those particularly in a position to better understand maybe what was happening, who began to really look to their own ethnic roots. Bear in mind, too, that in the country at large, there was a similar a tendency on the part of ethnic groups to seek out their own roots. The very word roots took on such a tremendous impact as a result of the work of Alex Haley, uh, who, who did this thing for, for the black population this country. Uh, I, I have no doubt whatever that the ethnic revitalization process among the white ethnic populations of this country had a whole lot to do with the successes of the civil rights movement for the black ethnic population. Uh, nonetheless, I think that, that Barry Osselet and others like him, and there were many, began to really look to their own past and their own uh, feeling for their ethnic backgrounds. And boy, did they find them. It was an incredible experience for them. Uh, they began then to say, hey, if this really exists for us and if it's as important to us as we feel that it is to us, we better start doing something to try to spread the word. And they did. They began to proselytize, in effect, uh, for a revitalized uh, ethnic awareness. And I believe succeeded in some, some important ways in doing so. While Codafil had directed its early efforts toward the language question and developed an international French outlook, the ethnic revival movement turned inward to the traditional folk culture for inspiration and found it most of all in the music. We're having a Saturday morning Boudin Jamboree. <laughs> Pass me a Coke over there, would you please do it? That, that, you guys just get me up. Every Saturday morning we have a, a free-for-all, uh, spontaneous jam session. You're right in the midst of it right now. You're at Savoy Music Center, you know, Louisiana. We don't conduct business on Saturday morning. We just, you know, have a good time. We have a rule here on Saturday morning. Anybody that answers the phone has to deal with it. If you answer the phone, you deal with it. Don't call, the, don't call me. Whether spontaneous or in performance, in dance halls or at festivals, traditional styles or modern blends, music became the standard bearer for what's known as the Louisiana French Renaissance Movement. And it's not just Cajun music that's thriving, enjoying national and international acclaim. If there's one thing the country connects with the word Cajun today, it's food. Okay, this is our first Brobridge Crawfish Etouffee Cook-Off 1, we are calling it. The rules are that you cook a minimum of three pounds. You can cook more if you like. This is the professional division, and today we have nine entries. The cooks are required to cook everything on the festival grounds. There's no pre-cooking of anything, and we ask that they, that they serve the Etouffee presentation style. This is going to be on a plate with no rice, because we don't want our judges to fill up on rice. Presentation style, they will be judged presentation, aroma, flavor, and taste. Most people think of eating crawfish and all, but we're doing something different here this year at the festival. We're serving the etouffee. We like to talk about it, we like to cook it, and best of all, we like to eat it. And while Cajun food used to mean the stuff in the pot, these days it's also cuisine. An event 
called the Acadiana Culinary Classic is now held each year in Lafayette to showcase an upscale version of South Louisiana food. Like the music, the vitality and creativity at home springs partly from enthused acceptance outside Louisiana. The ambassador of Cajun cuisine is Chef Paul Prudhomme, whose best-selling cookbook and creative cooking style gave Americans something they hadn't seen or tasted before. Like somebody said, they used to laugh at crawfish, but they don't anymore. But the Cajun revival isn't just cultural. Cajun food is also big business these days, even in New Orleans. Chef Prudhomme's Cajun Magic Corporation, a name devised for his specially blended seasonings, operates out of a neighborhood warehouse, selling two to 300,000 bottles monthly. The increasing use of the word Cajun by outside business interests angers some Cajuns like those who insist on the integrity of local ingredients in their products. Chef Paul takes a philosophical view of the situation. I think that Cajun, the word Cajun is being exploited, and I think it's going to continue to be exploited. That's bad. That's the bad part of, of all the publicity and all the hoopla. But there's also a good side to it. And I've seen it happening with the music as well as with the food. If the things that happen to Cajun food and the Cajun music had not a happened, but now it would be almost out of existence. It happened at the perfect moment that there was still enough knowledge left to, that that part of the culture is being saved. Uh, the people can't live like they used to. Uh, the, the, they can't do the things they used to do as far as growing all their food and, and you know, getting together and have dances. And, I mean, it's just not that way anymore. They have telephones now, and they have, uh, they have electricity, and they have bills to pay. They gotta buy water. You know, they gotta do all these things that we didn't do when I was a kid. So they have to go out in life and earn money, make a living. And so the whole culture has changed. But what's happened is that there's parts of the culture that is the soul of it, the food and the music, that is growing again. And, and again, it's gonna be different. You know, I've heard some, some rock and roll Cajun music. Well, 10 years ago, they would have offended the hell out of me. I mean, it really would have. But now I think that's great. I mean, it's not Cajun music to the sense of the traditional Cajun music, but it's, it's a part of its growth. And, you know, we've had great food and great music. We also had lousy food and, and lousy music. So it's nothing new. You know, I mean, that's going to be lousy parts to, to anything and great parts to it. So I feel that, that I think most of the Cajun people understand uh, that it's it's without all the things that would that's happening and it has happened that it would have been a lot more damaging than it is. Taking the bad with the good is one approach. Another is not to let respect for our heritage ever fade again. This is the second annual Bayou Cajun Folk Festival. And what we are doing here is we're trying to preserve uh, the people's knowledge and awareness of traditional aspects of Cajun culture. That is, uh, the culture of the people who live in the eastern part of what's known as South Louisiana or French Louisiana or Acadiana. The crafts that we have on display here or all crafts that can be documented as being a part of uh, life here in South Louisiana from the 19th century onward. We don't have a potter here because there weren't potters in South Louisiana, or at least in this part of it, um, uh, in the 19th uh, and early 20th centuries. Uh, but we do have a moss jenner. Uh, that was an important industry around here. We have a cistern maker, everyone, uh, had a cistern 40 or 50 years ago. 
We have um, boat builders, because that was and still is a very important uh, part of our local economy and our way of life. And while it's true that there are a lot of people down here who do not speak French anymore, uh, we still have uh, many young Cajun boys that are learning how to build boats. And uh, they go trapping, and they go shrimping. There are young musicians who play, not exactly the kind of music their parents listen to, but nobody does that. Uh, but it, it, they are developing uh, along the lines of the culture that they come from. This festival is not only here to preserve the knowledge of something that existed in the past, but as we can see, it's continuing to evolve uh, in the present. We take a somewhat of a purist attitude toward it, but considering the crowd, uh, I don't think they're uh, at all unhappy with that. And Cajun culture will continue to change, incorporating some of the past, absorbing more of the present, adapting to the realities of the future. The challenges are there, economic, cultural, and social, not just for us, but for all people of South Louisiana. We are not isolated anymore. Will there be Cajuns and Cajun culture in the future? What will Cajun identity be? Our food, our music, our memories of a shared language? In modern times, it does get harder and harder to tell who and what we are. Traditions once in the home are now part of public celebrations, folk festivals, even commercial business ventures. Can they still retain their meaning, and will pride in our heritage carry us forward into the 21st century? The answers to all these questions are just about as varied as the Cajun people themselves. Mais après 300 ans, pourquoi lâcher? But after 300 years, why give up? Cajun Crossroads is funded under a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Southern Educational Communications Association.